So in light of this being a fifth Sunday, um, I oftentimes like to share a glimpse of shows I enjoy. Um, and so this is, since this is a, a fifth Sunday, I thought I'd share one of my favorite animated shows. Um, some of you know, it's on Disney Plus, and it's called Bluey. Thanks to Renee, I have a picture, okay? Now, th this show, it details the life of a puppy named Bluey, uh, who lives with her father, her mother, and her younger sister. Now, now, the show is supposed to be, it's supposed to be for preschoolers, but I'll, I'm going to tell you, the interactions between the mother and the father that they have with one another, the interactions they have with the puffy, puppies, it often teaches me how to be a, a better parent. So when Michelle and I watch episodes with our kids, not by ourselves, um, we laugh or sometimes we even end up in tears. So one of our favorite episodes, the, the father plays squash. Now it's produced in Australia, so there are a few language differences. I think that's, I think that's racquetball. And, and the father plays against his brother. And they invite Bluey and her younger sister to take part by using pretend video game controllers as a way for them to think they're engaged. Now, Bluey's dad always, always wins. So after the first game, Bluey, who is controlling her father, or pretend controlling, suggests, hey, can we, can we let them win the next game? Bluey wants to sacrifice winning to share joy. Louis's father says, no way, right? <laughs> but through the mysterious actions of the pretend video game controllers, Bluey and her younger sister make the dad lose and the uncle win. The, the loss communicates surrendering winning a game achieves a greater gain by bringing joy to others. Now, if, you're, if you happen to be older like me, this theme may be consistent with a line from one of the greatest sports movies produced in the 1990s, which is not The Sandlot, nor the original Space Jam. I'm not even talking about the movie The Mighty Ducks or, or a classic like A League of Their Own. I'm referring to a line said by actress Rosie Perez in the movie White Men Can't Jump. The line is, sometimes when you win, you really lose. And sometimes when you lose, you really win. And sometimes when you win or lose, you actually tie. And sometimes when you tie, you actually win or lose. Confused? So it's a humorous way to, to say that when you're good enough to win, sometimes acting like you win can cause hurt and harm. But sometimes when you surrender winning, you can bring help and healing. So what, what does this have to do with scripture? Actions of Christians affect others, and they specifically affect our ability to build bridges. Sometimes, sometimes our actions are helpful. Sometimes our actions are harmful. In the passage read earlier, Paul is continuing to address the Corinthians, uh, a question the Corinthians had asked about whether or not they had freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Those of you who are ready to be done with this topic will be happy to know this passage will serve as the bookend to this topic. Next weekend, Pastor Chris is going to lead us in the discussion on head coverings. <laughs> but as he, as he concludes, Paul's going to reiterate Yes, Christ has won that freedom. You are justified to eat meat, but eating meat whenever you want, acting out what you won, that can actually be damaging to others. So our big idea this morning is sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. 
Now, I know I communicated a few weeks ago, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. I, I want to make clear, I'm not backing down from that statement, okay? The key words, the key words here, sometimes when you act like, sometimes we have a misplaced, a misplaced focus. And when we have that misplaced focus, it costs us. We lose something. Eating meat, you have the freedom to eat. Sometimes that can be damaging and destructive. So, should the Corinthians eat meat sacrificed to idols? Paul's going to say, hey, it, it depends. What are the specifics of the situation? Paul's going to offer God's people a lesson in situational ethics. Rather than an absolute yes or an absolute no, he's going to teach Christians to consider the setting and the people we are around to determine what we should do. There are blessings and privileges you've been given in Christ. Sometimes you should enjoy those freedoms to the glory of God. And other times, you should exercise restraint. Because sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. Paul recognizes to determine right and wrong, to determine yes or no, Christians sometimes have a faulty compass that is contrary to the gospel. We function with the wrong ethic. Paul wants Christians to be aimed at the right thing, to have an accurate compass for how we make decisions. So to challenge how Christians make decisions, Paul will confront a counter-Christian ethic. So that's a, that's a view that's being used that opposes the gospel. And he's going to clarify a Christ-centered ethic, a, a view that is in line with the gospel. And to illustrate this Christ-centered ethic, sandwiched in the middle of those views, Paul's going to walk through some situations, uh, addressing scenarios where Christians should exercise freedom and others where Christians should exercise restraint. We'll conclude with those. So if you have a Bible or Bible app, open up to the passage read earlier, beginning with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, and we'll start there and see how Paul confronts a counter-Christian ethic. So he says, everything is permissible for me. Or everything is permissible. Notice, everything is permissible is in quotes. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. No one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. So Paul is highlighting how for some, the ultimate ethic, the way to make decisions about how to act, how to behave, was to assert the freedom they had won in Christ. So in using these quotes, Paul demonstrates how a theological statement could be modified into a motto or a slogan. In doing so, it can be manipulated into something to give permission for us to do what we want to do. Now, if you were with us when we were studying 1 Corinthians in the spring, you know that this is not the first time that Paul has highlighted this slogan. Back in chapter 6, verse 12, he said this, everything is permissible for me. Again, that's in quotes. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So in chapter 6, the slogan was being used to justify sexual immorality or sinful sexual practices. In chapter 10, here it's being used to justify eating meat sacrificed to idols. Now I mentioned this expression, this slogan, expresses a theological truth. It's kind of like a theological meme communicating or saying, hey, Christ died to set Christians free from the law. And because of that, because Christ set Christians free from the law, everything is permissible for me. There are no consequences for conduct. I can do whatever I want to do. Paul is using, he's showing how they're using theological truth to justify what they want. And that's, that's a misuse of theology. 
The Corinthians were misusing freedom in Christ to dismiss their role in decision making. Paul qualifies their motto saying, hey, your motto, it's incomplete. Sure, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Sure, everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. The gospel is not about freeing you from the law so you can do whatever you want to do. Have some common sense. You can use a theological truth to serve self, and that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ if you're not considering how it affects others. Concern for others is more important than you affirming self, more important than you gratifying self, more important than you fulfilling self. Theological truth was being perverted to serve self. This was not an implication of Christian doctrine. It was an exploitation of it. So let's, let's consider how ridiculous exploiting theological truths could be. The expression, I am forgiven in Christ, such good news. But I could use that truth to serve self, to harm others. Okay, so let's say, let's say Pastor Chris frustrates me. He says something that hurts my heart. So I go to him to talk about it, and he digs his feet in deeper and says, you know what, Paul, this is your problem. Now, I know it's wrong to sin in anger. I know I need to have self-control. But you know what? I know I'm forgiven if I sin. Jesus will forgive me no matter what I do. So I let him have it. I tell him what I'm really thinking, calling him all sorts of names not appropriate for a Sunday morning sermon, especially a fifth Sunday. And then I punch him in the gut. Now, in case you're concerned, this is not a real scenario. (laughs) In Christ, am I forgiven for that action? Yeah. But using that freedom to justify such an action, I would be manipulating truth to serve myself. It wouldn't be an implication of biblical doctrine. It would be an exploitation of it. Sometimes when you act like you win, you really lose. Using theological truths to to serve self, to dismiss how our actions affect others in the forms of slogans and mottos, that certainly happens in the church today. So a few examples. That motto, I'm free in Christ, a rich truth preached a couple weeks ago by Pastor Valentine, that can be manipulated to drink another beer, to, to take another glance at something inappropriate, to excuse how we complain and gossip about others because if there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus well then I have freedom to sin that's exploiting a theological truth sometimes when you act like you win you actually lose the the motto God is in control that can be used to dismiss personal responsibility in decisions buying a house in a particular location uh, taking a specific job Dating the the person that I want to date. I I say, if God doesn't want me to follow through, hey, he'll close the door. He'll stop me because God's in control. It's exploiting a, a theological truth to dismiss personal responsibility. Sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. The the motto, God saves sinners. That can be used to excuse personal responsibility to share the gospel with others. It's a way to justify apathy and laziness when it comes to the mission of making disciples. My actions don't matter. That's exploiting a theological truth to serve self. Sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. So so in his book, The Gospel, how the church portrays the beauty of Christ author and pastor Ray Orland highlights how Christians often use theology or often use Jesus himself to serve self. And one of the things he does is take take a teaching of Christ found in Matthew 5, 3 through 10, commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, 
where Jesus is upholding characteristics of humility, like being poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and he changes the language to help us see how foolish it is to use our theology to serve self. He writes, Blessed are the entitled, for they get their way. Blessed are the carefree, for they are comfortable. Blessed are the pushy, for they win. Blessed are the self-righteous, for they need nothing. Blessed are the vengeful, for they will be feared. Blessed are those who don't get caught, for they look good. Blessed are the argumentative, for they get in the last word. And blessed are the winners, for they get their way. That's not what scripture says. That type of behavior is contrary to the character of Christ or contrary to how God's people are to live. Yet Christians use Christ or they use their theology to justify that type of behavior. Lord, forgive us for using our theology to serve self. What theological truths are you exploiting to serve self? To, to dismiss personal responsibility in how you relate to others. To, to diminish considering the good of others. How are you misusing principles of God's forgiveness to justify your behavior? Paul confronts a counter-Christian ethic. There are ways they are using theology to justify selfish actions. That's an exploitation of a theological truth. Sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. Now in verse 31, we'll jump there. Paul's going to clarify a Christ-centered ethic. And he writes, So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so that they may be saved. So the ethic Paul emphasizes to determine how we're to act, the compass for how we behave, is giving glory to God. It, it does not start with me and what I want. It, it begins with a view of what gives glory to God. Now, an application that's sometimes associated with this verse, whatever you do, delight in it. Whatever you do, enjoy it. Whatever you do, receive it as a gift from God with thanksgiving. And it primarily focuses on how I experience moments of life as an individual in relation to God. Okay, there's, there's some partial truth to that, but that view is incomplete. Based on the context, what Paul is saying, he has in view how we experience moments of life, not as an individual, but, but in how we relate to others. What you have been given, hold with an open hand. Be ready to give it away. Don't grasp and grip it. Be ready to surrender it for a greater gain. Paul, Paul uses the language, give no offense. What does that mean? What he's saying is, as we consider actions and behavior, consider the perspectives of others. And that's going to include what Paul's saying here. That includes people who embrace religion. That's the Jew. That includes people who are not religious. That's the Greek. And that includes people who who follow Christ. That's the church of God. Refrain from things that would unnecessarily offend. Now, some of you, the thought of refraining from behavior that could offend, in your mind, that, message, that, that means softening the message of the gospel. You hold on to a motto, the gospel is offensive, and you use that motto to excuse offensive behavior. If you're being offensive with speaking the truth in love to others because you long for them to grow more into the image of Christ, that may be okay. But, but if you're being offensive to feel better about yourself, to prove your point, to make yourself look more righteous, that's not about others. 
that's about you. And that's destructive. Your guide for actions and behavior, your ethic does not begin with a, a focus on self. It begins by considering the perspective of others. Now, Paul, Paul is not trying to appease people here. He's not trying to be a doormat. He's not living out of fear of man. He says he's not speaking, or he's not seeking his own benefit, but the benefit of many. He's trying to build bridges so others may know Christ. He doesn't want to lose those bridges in how he behaves. That's what it means to refrain from behavior that could offend. Because sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. You destroy those bridges. It makes sense that giving glory to God plays out in how we relate to others. Not seeking our own benefit, but the benefit of many. Because the God we are giving glory to, he didn't hold on to everything he had. He didn't exercise his rights and status as he related to a people who didn't act like him. Instead, he sent his son into the world. Christ sacrificed his life for sinners so people like you and I would be saved. The gospel teaches us God surrenders much for people who don't hold on, who don't hold the right views or who live the right kinds of lifestyle. If we are caught up in giving glory to that God, it changes the way we relate to others. And that will be seen by others. The, the late pastor and theologian Francis Schaeffer in his essay, Two Contents, Two Realities, writes, if we do not show beauty in the way we treat each other, then in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of our children, we are destroying the truth we proclaim. So Schaefer here is focused on how we treat others in church, but what he's saying can certainly be applied to how we treat all kinds of people. And that's what Paul has in mind. There are ways we behave and interact with others that gives glory to God. And there are ways we act and behave that does not glorify God. Our actions have a potential to undermine or support our, our, our witness, our testimony, what we're saying about who God is. Paul is pleading for people to know the gospel. They are going to encounter, encounter the lives of a Christian. What will they encounter? People who like to offend over all kinds of different things? Or people who are humble and gracious and, and sacrifice much for the sake of others? The, the Christians at Corinth used their, their freedom in Christ for personal gain. They used their freedom in Christ to justify sinful decisions and sometimes to dismiss responsibility in decision making. They used their freedom to justify hurting and harming other Christians and destroying potential bridges with non-Christians. Are we willing to examine our hearts and consider how that might be true of us? How we may excuse our apathy how we may use theology to justify being offenses, is everything is permissible our motto for how we engage the Christian life? Or is our ethic determined by doing everything to the glory of God? So I mentioned earlier to illustrate this Christ-centered ethic, sandwiched in the middle of this confrontation and clarifying, Paul addresses scenarios where Christians can exercise freedom, and others where Christians should exercise restraint. So to help us grasp this ethic, let's examine those scenarios. Let's start with situation, situations where it's fine to exercise freedom. In verse 25, Paul says, eat everything that is sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience. Since the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, if any of the unbelievers invite you over and you want to go, eat everything that is set before you without raising questions for the sake of conscience. So last week in forbidding eat meat sacrifice to idols, Pastor Chris told us 
the setting was a pagan temple. Doing that was an act of idol worship. It was dining with demons. Here, the place for eating meat is homes. Different setting, different situations. And in homes, Paul says, there is freedom. Some people needed to hear this because they would go around the meat market desperately searching for food that had not been sacrificed to idols. They had a conscience that was overactive or oversensitive because they thought that, 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 that food would corrupt them. Paul is saying that issue of conscience, it isn't necessary. God made that meat. As a Christian, you are free to eat what God has created. And if a non-Christian invites you over and you want to go, eat whatever food is put before you. You don't have to inquire where it came from. Enjoy the food. There is freedom you've been given in Christ. Enjoy that freedom. So many of you kids in the room, you have been taught to ask permission to eat certain foods and to drink certain drinks. As you get older, you're going to be taught to be home at a certain time, to let your parents know what time you will get home. There, there are certain rules you live by to submit to authority. Following those rules, typically, that does not continue throughout all of life. Imagine being 30 years old, asking a mom or dad, can I have a drink of Coke? Can I, can I eat that cookie? That's not the way it's supposed to work. Individuals have freedom as they get older. As my kids experience that freedom, there is rejoicing. They ask, can I have a drink of Coke? You know what? You have matured to the point you no longer have to ask. You are mature enough to make those decisions. You get self-control. You know how to make a good decision. You have freedom now. Enjoy that freedom. People that are enslaved to religion, they need to ask if meat was sacrificed to idols. They needed to know that meat was not corrupt. Religious activity is what made them righteous. For the Christian, not because of anything we have done, not, not because we have demonstrated a particular level of maturity, but because of what Christ has done, we have freedom to eat that meat. Christian, like you would savor a good piece of steak or s some piece of chicken, I'm not sure what vegetarians savor. <laughs> Take time to savor and enjoy the benefits of the life you've been given in Christ. Rejoice at how you've been forgiven from past sin. Don't wallow in shame and false guilt. Give thanks for the community, the family God has given you. Sometimes it's a good thing to, to rejoice at the life you have in Christ. And so sometimes when you act like you win, you do not lose. Giving away freedom for the benefit of others, that does not mean abstinence. There are times when you should celebrate what you've won. And so in light of that, in what ways do you need to grow at celebrating what Christ has won for you? So after holding up a situation where Christians have freedom to eat meat, Paul presents a situation where refraining from eating that meat sacrificed to idols is what they should do. Because sometimes when you act like you win, you actually lose. So here's verse 28. But if someone says to you, this food is from a sacrifice, do not eat it out of consideration for the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. So, so the situation here is you find yourself in a home that the person knows you're a Christian. And so they want you to know that this food was sacrificed to idols. They associate you as someone who would not be okay with idol worship. Now, you have freedom to eat that meat, but, but for the sake of that person, you could misuse that freedom. 
Eating meat may communicate you're okay with idol worship. It may communicate that you don't take matters of faith seriously. It may communicate that you're not all that serious about Christ. Rather than go into a discourse about, about why they're wrong and why you have freedom to, to eat that meat, rather than exercise your freedom, it's better to abstain. Such an action builds a bridge with the individual who is concerned about behavior. Such an action provides an opportunity for a greater gain. Okay, Paul is teaching Christians here to be socially aware. You're giving someone an initial impression. Your actions provide a glimpse about what you believe. And in a world that dismisses the significance of morality, in a world where people are often focused on self and self-gratification, Paul wants the impression you give to be connected to self-restraint and sacrifice, and humility. So Kyle Osborne mentioned last Sunday that a number of us headed out recently to a, a retreat with men from our church and men from outside our church. Those of you who know me well that know, know that during retreats, I love to get away and read for a bit and to not interact with anyone. I'm exercising freedom from having to be busy, to enjoy the gift of rest. There is certainly freedom in Christ for, for me to do this type of thing. So on, on Saturday morning during that retreat, uh, I snuck out into an empty room with a few chairs and couches and a cup of coffee and a good book, and I started to read. So delightful. But after a few minutes, a, a man from outside our church walked in. He had a book and a cup of coffee, too. I thought I was safe. But, but he sat down, and he looked at me, and he started talking. You're one of the pastors from First City, aren't you? My silent retreat was shattered. When I'm known as the pastor of First City Church, being socially aware, considering others, means taking my, my focus off of self and on to another. Being socially aware means my actions are about to be associated with the pastoral office that I hold. And it's about to be associated with the people of First City Church that I'm connected to. In a world where people are focused on self, what is the first impression that I want to offer? I have freedom in Christ in that moment to not talk to this man. But exercising that freedom could be harmful. And my first reaction isn't to explain all the reasons that I'm justified to sit there and read that book, to not answer his questions. It's to respond and interact. Because I know my response is communicating something about who Christ is to me. Am I someone who uses my freedom to serve self? Or can I lay that freedom down for the benefit of others? I don't know about you all, but sometimes I want to exercise my freedom to drop a meme on social media. Sometimes I want to listen to, to certain types of music when others gather in my home. Sometimes I want to use my freedom to, to talk politics. Sometimes I want to use my freedom to, to escape and withdraw to the comfort and pleasure of my phone and not be present with others. Sometimes I want to exercise my freedom and I want to stick to my agenda and my plan. And I don't care who it offends. I'm entitled to do those actions and I have freedom in Christ to do so. I can justify that. But sometimes when I act like I win, I actually lose. I give a poor impression of what it means to be a Christian and who Christ is. In concluding his thoughts, contrasting this counter-Christian ethic and a Christ-centered ethic for thinking through how to act in situations, Paul says in chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
When you're known as a Christian, your actions represent Christ. The decisions and behaviors of a Christian are intended to to point to the life that Christ lived and the death that he died. So a a Christian imitates or reflects or images Christ. The life of such a person is to make Christ real to people on earth. Ray Ortland says it this way. We're not here to show people how wrong they are. We're here to show everyone how gracious Jesus is and to win people to that Jesus. Paul wants people to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Jesus certainly had much. Status, power, fame, innocence, freedom from shame, wholeness, and he was willing to give it all up for a greater gain. He was willing to surrender his status as God's beloved son to hang on a cross, to be crucified as a criminal. He was willing to give up his power to be betrayed and be beaten and bruised over and over and over again. He was willing to give up his fame to die in isolation alone. He was willing to give up his innocence to take on the sin and guilt of sinners like you and I. He was willing to give up freedom from shame to carry our sorrow and sadness and our shame to the cross. And he was willing to give up the wholeness he experienced with his heavenly father to experience the separation that you and I deserve in surrendering what he had in not using it to serve self. He did something greater for you and I. As we make decisions about how to act in specific situations, may we be caught up in his character. And in doing so, may we imitate the character of our Savior. Let's pray.